Thank you, Eric. Can you hear me well? Yes. So, uh, uh, grateful for the invite uh, from engineering point of view to uh, discuss about the transmission of SARS curve two. Uh, to me, is a uh, tragic that even 10 months into the pandemic, we still do not know how the whole thing is transmitted. I don't know why it's slow. So I need to thank a lot of people, uh, and, and including people from our Hong Kong U um, medical faculty, and also work with uh, quite a few CDCs uh, in order to uh, investigate some of the outbreaks, mainly from Guangdong CDC, Jiangsu CDC, and Hunan CDC. Um, one of the uh, uh, things we can start with is some kind of observations. Uh, and it appears that the transmission uh, mostly occur at close range, they dominate, uh, and this probably explains why social distancing worked. And we also have seen some long range transmission uh, reported occasionally, uh, and this often leads to super spreading events. Uh, uh, although actually it's, it's, it's not a small number of them, uh, but uh, relatively compared to a close range transmission, not that much. So the, ma the mass face masks seems to work. The exact reasons, I'm not sure if they fully understood. And they have some filtration effect. Uh, uh, but uh, with my talk, you may find that the jet blockage, the blockage of your expired jet may uh, 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 play a, a greater role. And we also know the most infection occurs indoors. And, and I was reviewing a paper today uh, and on outdoor and, and people try very hard uh, to find the outdoor outbreaks uh, and very, very small number. So in this talk and, and there, the aerosols are referred to uh, those that contain infectious uh, uh, microbes. And I also uh, want to make sure that when I talk about large droplets, I refer to uh, those uh, larger than 70 microns. And it's, it's common in the literature, it says everything larger than five or 10 microns are large droplets, and which are wrong. Um, we, uh, here, I like to focus on the uh, two kinds of uh, aerosols, uh, the respiratory, and those are uh, probably produced in the lungs or in the upper respiratory tract, and they travel uh, uh, along the respiratory tract and, and, uh, and, and then exhale out. Um, then they evaporate because they contain water, mostly water. And, and then uh, in the expired jet and, and this process and some viruses survive. And you, your, your, your exhalation probably uh, at uh, the peak velocity of 2 or 10 meters per second uh, and, and, and the flow in the jet is turbulent. Um, of course, uh, in the fecal virus refer to this uh, uh, relative to feces, and this can be uh, from toilets. And again, people say this, you can have a toilet uh, flushing plumes. So at this moment, we actually do not know uh, um, if some other uh, fecal virus play a role, and I will come back to that. Um, for respiratory, and that's basically the main focus uh, right now, I'm, uh, there are evidences to show they play a major role, but the fecal errors seem to be uh, uh, some circumstantial evidence. And the magic, the myth, probably this uh, aerosol generating procedures, uh, the, the only procedure uh, at the early stage, the, the World Health Organization recognized the possible uh, long, range, uh, long range airborne transmission. Um, but, you know, I have not seen really uh, good uh, uh, evidence for it. Um, but you have expired aerosols, which I focus today. Uh, I have not studied any, I, I call them medical aerosols. For uh, fecal aerosols, actually there are two uh, possible sources. One is the toilet, when you flush. The second, when you flush, and the water would uh, uh, fall into a vertical stack. And in Hong Kong, you have these high-rise buildings. And then you can see how they play a role, and I would call them stack aerosols. I don't think there is a formal name for it, uh, because this vertical pipe 
uh, in drainage system is called a vertical stack. And so for, let me start with respiratory aerosols. And very often we divide them into uh, uh, the short range and the long range. And the threshold can be anything between one meter to possibly up to two meters. In, for the last 17 years, I have always used number 1.5. And it's amazingly, different countries have a different uh, 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 threshold distance. Uh, I think in many places using one, some places using two. And so within the short range, um, then many rules are possible, very complicated. And, and you can be traditionally called large droplets. I refer to 75 microns and the larger. And this is due to deposition uh, to the membranes of your eye, your uh, nostril, and, 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 and your mouth. And then you can also inhale it. So this could be short range air bomb. And on the other hand, uh, uh, your, your eyes, your nose, and, and your, 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 your nostril, and then your, your, your mouth, and the area only 10% of your mouth. So you also have deposition of the rest of the areas, which can also lead to what I call the immediate surface roots. Uh, and very often, we know very little about it. So at a distant level, two routes at least possible. One is due to the air bomb inhalation, and the second is due to formite, uh, and formite surface touch. And formite we will not uh, talk about today. I do have two outbreaks where I really feel there is a role to play for the formite. So this is a busy table, but basically you have different size of particles, and then Normally we have droplets and the droplet would evaporate. Okay, so there's difference between particle and droplet. But particles are easier to consider. So when you have uh, exhaled uh, from your mouth, then as I mentioned earlier on, you have 1.5 meters of travel. Velocity may be two meters per second, let's say average one meter per second, which means the five droplet would travel about 1.5 seconds in the expired jet. And of course the larger ones will not survive them because the large droplets would fall let's say for 50, 100 microns, where the terminal velocity of the things can be more than a, 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 a 70 millimeters per second. But for five and 10 microns, they will never fall. They take a long time to fall. So that's why they suspend in the air. And it's understandable why we get five and 10. But very often people ignore that if it is inside your uh, exhaled uh, jet, the things are different. Things dry out, the droplet would evaporate. They dry out very quickly. If it takes 1.5 seconds to reach to travel, and then the evaporation is only of some milliseconds, and this means actually those droplets evaporate out completely, even before they get out of your expired jet. You almost immediately uh, at the exit of the mouth. So the virus actually live in the two different worlds. One is the close range, and this is your jet, and the one is a distant. So in the close range, the velocity is higher, and they stay there for a second or something, and, and, and for less than 20 microns, they evaporate fully. Uh, and uh, uh, in this flow, because the velocity is very high, so 75 can be airborne. So it's, 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 it's a very different concept. And there's a high concentration around droplets, so greater viability, so there's a higher risk. And then most importantly, the concentration of those uh, uh, gases uh, or, or fine droplet decays as a function one over D. But if you move your uh, head around and then your jet uh, 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 range uh, the, you know, is greater, so that will decay one over D squared. So it all depends uh, how you do it. So this is very important. And for this range, only 10, Micron can be airborne and relatively low uh, exposure. And I believe there's a continuum between the two. And with uh, Dr. Lindsay Marsh's work, we know that in the droplets, the virus live in a, a very polluted water environment. And, drop, uh, and, and, and the virus only uh, is very small uh, in terms of the mass, uh, it's very, very small actually it's, it's surrounded by all by this polluted environment. So uh, uh, that uh, the survival, everything 
becomes important, which I'm not expert. I hope to understand a little bit more in the future. However, for a long time, we consider, we have been uh, uh, debating about, uh, you know, what is airborne, how relative uh, uh, importance as compared to large droplets. And, uh, and uh, many, some years ago, we look into how the fine droplets uh, uh, decays, uh, evolve, and then we look at two people and the distance between the two uh, uh, on the horizontal axis. So if they are very close, then uh, the exposure risk is much higher. And as you move away from that, that's why 1.5 comes from, and then the concentration decays very fast. So depending the airflow patterns in the room, the long distance concentration can vary. So there are many ways. So uh, fluid, dynamics, fluid dynamics people know this very well. We normally compare, we consider displacement ventilation and mixing ventilation, which are not going. The relative humidity play a lot of role here. So if the humidity is, is low and then droplet evaporates fast for a certain size and, and they don't fall. If the droplets is, if the humidity is high and then the droplet can fall. And, uh, and, and I was criticized by one uh, uh, participants some time ago said, here you should talk about survival of droplets, uh, viruses, but I, 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 I know very little about it. So when the different sizes travels in a jet, then the large ones fall down very quickly within a meter. But 50s fall a little bit later because they are a little bit larger and the very fine ones being carried away. But if you have one millimeter droplets, they don't fall. I mean, they just like stone, you throw them away, right? So there is a, there is a continuum and turbulence is very important. And this is all well known uh, in the fluid mechanics area. So if there's, uh, uh, and then if you have fluctuation, then spread around, basically. And very, very important one is about uh, the difference between so-called large droplet transmission and how large are the, droplet, are the large droplets. And this can be done by uh, looking into something called Stoke number and, and Stoke number so less than 0.1, actually they never deposit and if only larger than one it deposits. With this, you can easily calculate a threshold virus uh, uh, size. Unfortunately, I only figured out, we only figured this out last year, just about time for this year. And, uh, and I think nowadays uh, we had a, a number of meetings early on, WHO, CD, US CDC, and, and AS. Uh, and now I think uh, uh, people do accept. Uh, it's not five or 10. We are talking about inside your, 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 your exhale droplets. And so it was the large one and small ones follow. Okay, small ones don't deposit on your face. With this background, and we actually simply do, a, uh, this has nothing to do with COVID-19 at this moment. We compare the large droplets and short range airborne, the ratio between the two, and you find out that as a function of distance and for coughing and talking, actually they're all less than one. And this means short range airborne dominates. And this assume the concentration of viruses are the same in all sides of droplets, which obviously are wrong uh, and which cannot be the case. And, and, and so, but for talking, you can see that it's all less than 0.1. And, and it's only for coughing when you have a distance less than 0.1, uh, a very close distance, then uh, the large droplet dominates, I mean, become important, significant. So basically you can see the, 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 the large droplets, very difficult to tell. I mean, very difficult to say that they are important. I think from this, uh, one may see that uh, short range airborne dominates, but we need more work. And this was only uh, from uh, uh, droplets rather than uh, uh, fire aerosols. So I like going into uh, uh, three outbreaks. So one of them, I think, is a Guangzhou restaurant outbreak. Um, this one, uh, well known uh, for people, our work have not been published. Uh, uh, so the family A in the middle came from Wuhan and for a visit. And uh, on the Chinese New Year Eve, January 24th, they had a, a lunch uh, in this restaurant where they have two local Guangzhou families, quiet, and they don't speak that, uh, talk that much. Um, 
then they infected uh, a few people on the two neighboring tables. Amazingly, other tables, 217, 218, and two T04, no, 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 no customers. And, two, and these two tables, 17, 18, and nobody was infected. So, um, uh, but the distance between this uh, index case and uh, the first index case is, is about 4.5 meters. So this is longer and people become interested in that. So we measured the ventilation rate afterwards. We, we, uh, we had access to this restaurant and we found it very low. It's just one liter per second per person. Normally in ventilation, we give people about eight or 10 liter per second per person. So this is very, very low. And this restaurant, um, I think even today is unique because uh, they, uh, it happened, uh, they were able to keep uh, the surveillance video uh, 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 of, of the time, at the time, and there were three cameras in this restaurant. So we, uh, very confidential, so that we were not allowed to take them out. We can only analyze them in Guangdong CDC. And so we know exactly every table when they come arrive, when they leave for uh, say the index case family arrive at zero, uh, time zero. And, and then they left at 80, they stayed there for 82 seconds, 82 minutes. And the last family was 17. We had a lot of problem with the 17 and this particular 17 table. And so we know exactly the overlap time and the time they left, even they left, you know, because ventilation is bad. So the virus would still stay inside. So we have to consider the survival of the droplets and also filtration efficiency of those air conditioning unit. It took us a little bit of time to realize that. So uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it can play. And basically you can calculate because time I go very quickly. Uh, uh, to the next outbreak. So this one is interesting. Uh, uh, a young man went home on January 24th, just before Chinese New Year, from Changsha to another city in Hunan, and he took two buses. One bus for two, three hours, the other bus for one hour. And he infected more on the first bus, the second, less on the second bus. Actually, we also had access to the bus, uh, two buses, had an original driver on the original road, we measure the ventilation rate and dispersion of uh, droplets. And then we find out uh, uh, the second bus actually ventilated at three liter per second per person. The first one, a little bit above, uh, uh, below two. So this is why we feel that anything less than three liter per second per person is not safe. And uh, unfortunately, these two, uh, the videos were, uh, we only had a few uh, photos and the videos were destroyed. And, and and unfortunately for any other outbreaks, and those videos are not available. And, and that's why these two outbreaks became useful. I think the Diamond Princess data, uh, we still looking at the data and, and the fact there were not so many cases that in the same room have two cases, even before the outbreak. And I made this case long time, uh, although we don't have measurement of ventilation rate in those uh, ships and because these high-end cruise ships and the ventilation rates should be more than uh, eight, uh, probably around 10 liters per second per person based on standard. So uh, basically it says that the uh, air conditioning in those rooms may not be, the ventilation rate, if it is eight, 10 liters per second, probably uh, uh, sufficiently good. And this is still under debate, but less than three is problematic. So this would constitute an opportunistic airborne transmission and insufficient ventilation is a problem. However, we, uh, uh, I think short range airborne formite are not ruled out. And so I now feel that this is similar to influenza in which we still have uh, a lot of confusions about transmission route. So it's basically it's non airborne transmission and turn into airborne transmission when there's uh, insufficient ventilation. I think this is very important. I always feel if this is, can be done, then you basically ventilate well with a mask, you can go back to work. Unfortunately, we cannot figure out the roles of formite and other things. Anyway, one of the things we don't figure out is the fecal uh, uh, aerosols. And I talk about, not toilet now, about stack aerosols. And we studied a Moy Garden outbreak of SARS-CoV-1 back in 2003, and we
considered this uh, airborne uh, routes and as an earlier part of the pandemic, everybody thought, oh, this was a, 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 a good case to go back to consider. Uh, but um, very few uh, probably have real, might not have realized we forgot to study one. We got the answer wrong, at least for this where index case stay in the uh, major, uh, in, the, in the index building, index room here, every flat is a little box here. And the, the red one is where index patients stay. And this is flat seven, basically these vertical flats. There are 33 flats on this. Uh, on this. Actually, I forgot the first one, uh, how much, yeah, from four to 30, 36. So, but along this one, you can find the, the things that uh, uh, this, this vertical flats, and there's also many flats were infected. And downstream due to airflow, of course, the flats eight had many families got infected. But why, what happened to flats seven? And this time in Guangzhou, the mo one of the most important outbreaks, because this, we were told that this outbreak actually encouraged uh, 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 China CDC to consider this whole thing had the possibility for aerosol transmission. Basically, in a high-rise building of uh, this is 27th floor, 25th floor, and the 15th floor, there is a family, and which in fact two families above. And in this family, uh, 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 actually, all this 502 to 702, the only use is a very nice room uh, flat, and they only use the master bedroom. So basically, and they've also detected environmental samples on 1602, a positive sample. And they had 200 samples. I remember when this paper was reviewed, and the reviewer said, why you worry about this, this, this outbreak? Only few people infected uh, in Guangzhou at the time. Actually, we also carry out uh, trace gas studies and on 21st February, and we basically feel that uh, this is due to aerosols, uh, 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 through the vertical stack. But the question is, how did the fecal aerosol leak to a flat? In the literature after uh, uh, 2003 uh, SARS outbreak, people consider due to flushing toilets. Actually, when you flush a toilet, when you flush one toilet or two toilets, you introduce a kind of pressure inside the vertical stack. And normally, at a high level, they all negative meaning pressure inside stack negative. It can be as high, high rise it can be as high as 500, negative 500 or 1000 Pascal. And this is very high, you know, normally across the door only two or three or 10 Pascal. So it's negative. If there's anything, it should go into the stack instead of going out. Only at the bottom, you have a little bit uh, uh, kind of positive pressure. And if that's the case, should be lower stories got the impact. So this one obviously cannot explain what happened. So, Yogu, you have two minutes. Uh, uh, Dong Yan introduced me uh, uh, to Professor Ky Yun, and we study the uh, Leyen outbreak in Satian. And in this outbreak, one family at 812 flats infected uh, uh, flats 810710, 110, 12, and 1112. These are huge flats. So then you find out that this, this uh, flats 10 and, uh, and, and 12, they are connected by the, the pipes. So on the right hand side, in, uh, in addition to Amoy Garden, I listed four other outbreaks. So they all have a common thing, all right? Only up stories infected. So for the Guangdong outbreak, uh, uh, it was published some time ago, and then basically we consider it's due to chimney effect. So during non-flushing period, so there's a chimney effect. So the flow goes up, and that's why up stories got infected. If this is true, if you have four or five outbreaks, and then the question is why not elsewhere? Probably difficult to tell. If the fecal aeros aerosols play a role, how about toilet aerosols? So I think better when you go to toilets and you keep uh, 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 your, your, you keep your uh, toilet seats uh, clean. You better disinfect so toilet clean uh, seats. We are, after all the study, I also think that uh, the current definition of the transmission route is very confusing. And what is airborne? For me, air does not transmit. If the air don't flow, the virus will stay where it is. 
I mean, you have a little bit of diffusion. So it's the air flow, the inhalation. So maybe people should rethink how do we call those outbreaks, uh, the transmission rules. Airborne transmission, I guess, uh, talked it down Milton the other day. We uh, actually, I changed one. I used to call it air flow transmission, but uh, air inhalation transmission. Large droplet transmission is more confusing. It's probably droplet spray transmission. The formite, I don't know. For people who don't speak English, formite is very difficult to understand. What is this whole thing called formite? And probably just surface touch. You focus on more the transfer action folks, and that's very easy, perhaps, to control. Anyway, for respiratory aerosols, I believe in uh, short range airborne dominance. And, and only when the ventilation is not good, you go to insufficient ventilation. Should be quantified. People uh, really should uh, uh, look into this. And the fecal aerosols cannot be ignored based on what we have seen so far. Thank you very much. Eric, back to you. Thank you, Yogu. Um, that was a fascinating talk. It's something I think that transmission is on, on a lot of people's minds just in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so if anyone has, any of the participants have any questions, please raise your hands. Um, uh, Darcy Kelly, um, you should be able to talk if you unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, so I've always been concerned about the, the, this last route of transmission. And uh, what's never been clear to me is what the proportion of live virions are. I mean, clearly from the Hong Kong data, it's, it is possible that, that this is transmitted um, via the drainage pipes from the toilets. But in the United States, people test, uh, use tests to, uh, group tests within a dormitory, for example, um, to, uh, to identify community outbreaks. And so uh, I wonder whether there were any direct measurements of the percentage of live virions um, that could be transmitted via the fecal route as opposed to just detecting um, genetic material from dead virions. I hope that was clear. Uh, yeah, that's very, very clear, very important. And this is part of the problems. And, and uh, I am not aware of any uh, uh, publications and from uh, the drainage aerosols, it shows the, uh, the virus is, is, uh, is viable. And I'm aware of the efforts here in Hong Kong and elsewhere in terms of drainage uh, waste water, sorry, in the uh, sewage waste water uh, measurement. In Hong Kong, there is an effort to measure uh, uh, the waste water in what we call the, uh, the terminal manhole, basically from a large building estate and linked to the public sewer, where they also uh, had uh, positive samples, but uh, I'm not sure if they have ever seen uh, uh, live uh, viable viruses. So uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a, a problem and but uh, it's very hard to deny, as you mentioned, the, the pattern we have seen so far. And, and, and this is where it becomes um, interesting and, and why, uh, but we do know for the bus uh, outbreak, I reported early on, uh, and because the, the toilets was very bad on this old bus, so nobody used the toilets. So, uh, I mean, uh, that you can see it was not the, uh, the, the, the fecal aerosol. So uh, how much they play in the domestic setting uh, at this moment, as far as I know, the only paper published is our paper uh, at AIM, that's all. So we are working on the second paper uh, with Hong Kong data and, and the third paper with another one in Fosan. Uh, and, and that's all we know so far. Did I answer your question? I think Darcy. You did. Thank you. Um, I'm just now grateful that I live on a low floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yogu, I wanted to ask a quick question about the, the analysis of the restaurant and bus outbreaks. Um, and that was were the index patients in those cases active infections or were they asymptomatic at the time um, that they were in the bus or in the restaurant? 
it's uh, interesting for uh, the restaurant is for sure is uh, pretty symptomatic. Uh, and uh, I think the lady became symptomatic after uh, the lunch at the uh, evening time. And for the bus, uh, there are two stories. Uh, and it's simply not strong uh, symptoms. And, and the young man, he uh, claimed he did not cough. That's why he did not have a mask. But uh, uh, after four hours, uh, no, five hours travel, uh, uh, before arriving home, he bought a mask. And so he claimed he did not have uh, any, uh, uh, his symptom only became obvious after arrival at home. So um, this, I mean, those two uh, uh, outbreaks, you know, you, you have to recognize that uh, it was very early and, and there might be some asymptomatic, asymptomatic cases, uh, but uh, people were unaware of that, the existence. Yeah. Um, so that, but it's interesting, they all happened at the, at the you know, just before their symptoms uh, onset. And, um... William Gruskin, um, you're allowed to talk if you unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Can you comment on the risk of transmission from central forced air HVAC systems, both heating and air conditioning? Well, I think the air conditioning is not an issue and it is, is whether the ventilation is sufficient. There's a, I mean, I actually study air conditioning and, and there's a lot of confusion. I think the, uh, yes, the, uh, the filters in the air conditioning can become a reservoir, uh, but you know, they do uh, perhaps more good, as Jung Yen said, than harm. Uh, uh, I also believe uh, air should be allowed to, to flow. I mean, otherwise it's, it's, it's stagnant and it will cause more problems. So, however, if central air conditioning uh, uh, in this part of the world, we try not to circulate the air during the pandemic period. Uh, and so, uh, but providing sufficient ventilation, I think is the best way. 